Hey there, welcome back, bus riders. Another episode of On the Bus Podcast, episode number 74, and we got a doozy one for you today. Before we get into that, I got some announcements. I got some things to tell you guys, because if you haven't been following us, even though I'm pretty sure you have, but if you are new and you are a new subscriber, first of all, thank you. Number one, always the big thank you. Welcome, welcome on the bus. Number two, then you've already probably known that we've been traveling around South America. We've been touring the continent of South America. We took a bus from North America, brought it all the way down, buying the bus from high school Mormons, invading the continent of South America, taking this bus to places nobody has ever seen an American school bus before, and then taking this American school bus on places that should never have had an American school bus taken on them. And you're going to find that all on our YouTube channel. You're going to find all those podcasts, all the characters we met in our archives. I believe that's going to be between episodes 41 and 65. And man, we met some crazy people. We met some cool people. We had some amazing experiences. I'm really starting to get that PTSD now. All that post-traumatic stress, falling off cliffs, almost getting my toe taken off. Some crazy stuff happened down there. And uh, you can check out all those videos, all those adventures, our TV shows on YouTube, on the bus podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you share those videos. We can't do this without all you guys out there. You know, see subscribers, the people who listen episode after episode. Thank you so much. We love you. We thank you. And again, new guys, welcome on the bus. Now, back to everything else out there. Today's episode, for, first and foremost, my mind was blown. I mean, this guy took us took us on a journey. I thought I knew about the pots, marijuana, weed, CBD, terpenes. This guy took us on a journey. He took us down a, a rabbit hole from, you know, the history of marijuana and to the politics, to the trials, the studies and the legal framework that makes up this, you know, this new industry, this new, this new whole practice behind, you know, marijuana, whether it's the private practice or whether it's a business practice or medical practice. And our guest is Dr. Michael McKenzie. He's a board certified medical pra practitioner with a special interest in medical marijuana and is a certified medical marijuana physician in the state of Florida. Guys, what you knew about CBD, what you knew about terps, marijuana, and a lot of the, the history behind, you know, why this stuff was made illegal, why it was once legal to the histories of hemp. This guy takes us on a journey. I thought I knew a lot. He told me I know I know nothing to Mr. to Dr. McKenzie over here. So without further ado, we're gonna jeer it up and just just hold on to your seat, get your notepads out. Okay. Dr. McKenzie. Yes, sir. Welcome on the bus. bus. Oh, glad to be here. <laughs> We're super excited to have you here today. Um, you're a medical marijuana doctor, originally a, um, or still a, what's it called, a primary practice doctor? Well, I am a board certified family physician um, in private practice in Hallandale Beach, and I have a special interest in cannabinoid medicine. Uh, there is currently no board certification for things related to cannabinoids. So, you know, in medicine, when there is no specific board certification for something, we usually say, well, we have a special interest in XYZ. What does that mean, board certification? Um, that you're certified by the American Board of whatever specialty. Um, you take an exam, you recertify every 10 years. So you can't have a board certification because it doesn't exist. Right. Yeah, okay. So, you know, so to prevent people from making misleading claims, yeah. you know, we'll say, well, the, the doctor has a special interest in this topic because currently there is no board certification for cannabinoid medicine. Is that because the government doesn't, doesn't have, you know, view it, the federal government doesn't view it as sort of a medically responsible I don't know if the well is. no usually uh, for a board to exist it would have to fall under the American Board of Medical Specialties and the US medical establishment is still very in the dark about cannabinoids and cannabinoid medicine and why are they in the dark is there, are they in the dark because it's still schedule one it, when yes. the schedule one claims that there's no medical benefits or, or it's high, highly uh, addictive no in the they've been in the dark ever since 1937 um, from 1851 to 1942, cannabis was actually on the U.S. pharmacopoeia. It was given as a tincture, as a liquid, as an extract. And um, all the major pharmaceutical companies like Park Davis, Bristol Myers Squibb, made cannabis products. Um, and it was that way in the U.S. until around 1937, when a various number of factors, economic and political, caused cannabis to fall out of favor. Yeah, another real popular one was uh, the famous uh, newspaper owner. Yes, William Randolph Hearst. Because he did, uh, 
the hemp was going to be much cheaper for him to uh, use for his paper. And so he owned a bunch of paper mills. Yeah, lumber companies yeah. and paper mills. And hemp competed with, um, you know, the things that were produced by the DuPont family and the William Randolph Hearst in this world. And, um, you know, the um, because when cannabis was um, made out, outlawed by the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, they lumped in industrial hemp to that same category. Mm -hmm. All industrial hemp is, it's a cannabis plant without the THC. Okay. Now, there was a small window of reprieve during World War II because all the hemp production was being held by the Japanese, like in the Philippines and places like that. The U.S. had to ask farmers, especially in the Midwest and Kentucky, to grow hemp for, for the, the war effort. For the parachutes, right? Yes. Yeah, for the that. parachutes, for the ropes, for the ships, for the oil, for the guns, because mm. you got to keep the guns lubricated. The hemp was great, though. Yeah. And um, the, uh, the farmers were producing it. It was a specific campaign called Hemp for Victory. And then when World War II ended, so did this reprieve end, and they went back to its prohibitionist ways. Until around 1968, when there was a Supreme Court case of O'Leary versus the United States government, when um, O'Leary, um, I'm sorry, I think it was O'Leary versus the United States, not O'Leary, um, whereas the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 was declared unconstitutional because it violated the Fifth Amendment because you had to incriminate yourself and say that you want to possess cannabis in order to get this special stamp, which was impossible to get. Mm -hmm. So in response to the Supreme Court decision of Leary versus the US, that's when President Nixon um, put together the Schieffer Commission, which would construct what we know today as the Controlled Substance Act. 1971, in 1971 right? 1971, yeah. yes. Now, despite the recommendations of the Schieffer Commission, Nixon still put cannabis as a Schedule One. Was they recommended against it? Right, the Schaefer Commission oh. recommended against placing cannabis in a Schedule One or even criminalizing it. Wow. Isn't the assumption that he wanted to break up all these protests that were happening, and if all right. these guys and gals are smoking some pots while they're out at all these conventions or out there at protest? Yeah, I believe it was Ehrlichman, uh, one of his aides, who admitted that Nixon did that to get back at the groups that were protesting against him. Take the pots, you break up the protest. Right. And uh, <laughs> the war on drugs began at that point. And, um, now, there was some few rays of light in the darkness, okay? Um, for example, Oregon decriminalized it in 73. Really? Yeah. Not that long, I know that. And um, New Mexico, you know, um, declared that there's medicinal benefits for the medical, for cannabis. But the big thing happened around 1978, during the Carter administration. They created what's called the Compassionate Investigational New Drug Program, where that program was started because of a lawsuit against the U.S. government by a gentleman named Robert Randall, who was a glaucoma patient, and he found that um, cannabis helped with his glaucoma. And so he sued the government to use cannabis and won. And as a result, there was this program called the Compassion Investigation New Drug Program. It enrolled a lot of patients. Most of the patients were like either cancer patients or HIV patients when it was you know, during the 1980s when HIV was starting to um, be known in the US. And um, there was other patients uh, that were with other conditions as well that were signed up in that program where they would get cannabis cigarettes from the U.S. government every month. The cannabis would be grown on the campus of University of Mississippi in the Coy Waller Laboratory Complex in Oxford, Mississippi, which exists to this day. Started in 1968. Mm. Then the cannabis is shipped to Raleigh Durham, North Carolina Research Triangle where it is rolled into cigarettes, packaged, and then shipped to the patient. Real quick, I gotta go back to the Oxford, Mississippi because I don't think a lot of people know that that's where the U.S. government, like you said, has that campus where they can grow marijuana, right. and it's also because they own a patent on the plant itself. Is yeah, that that's a separate deal in and of itself. Really? Oh. But yeah. But um, the um, program ended <clears throat> around um, 1990 um, with uh, George H. W. Bush ending the program. The reason why they ended the program was because of the availability of a synthetic THC capsule called Marinol, which is nothing but synthetic THC in a capsule. And so, however, to avoid a lawsuit, George H. W. President George H. W. Bush grandfathered in the remaining patients that were alive in that program, as most of the patients that were parts of that program died already. Um, to this day, in 2018, there are four people still alive who were participants of that program, okay? Only two out of the four still get cannabis medicine to this day from the U.S. government. And that is Irving Rosenfeld, who lives in, for in Bar County, in Bar County, the Represent. Okay, and a lady named Elvi Musica. She lives in Oregon, and she has glaucoma. 
So Irving Rosenfeld has a bone disease ever since he was a child. He has a condition called, it's a long name, multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis, which means well you're, you have multiple small bone tumors that, on the long bones of the legs. That really rolls off the tongue right there. Yeah. One more yeah. time. Multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis. Wow. See, that's my fantastic. Uh, um, I'm going to see an opera on that one. But as, as the, uh, with the, these tumors, these tumors became very painful for him as a child. And, um, you know, he was on all kinds of narcotics, morphine, dilaudid, you name it. It wasn't until he was in college, he actually tried cannabis in a smoked form. He was amazed how that alleviated his pain. So he actually took on the U.S., the federal government, and won, and was able to be enrolled in a compassionate investigational new drug program in 1982. So from 1982 until today, Irving Rosenfeld received a canister of 300 cannabis cigarettes from the U.S. government. A year? A month? A month. A month. Oh, wow. What was the reason for allowing Marinol, the synthetic, versus cutting off the, the marijuana that they were using? One sec. Um, the reason why they started using Marinol was because a large pharmaceutical company, I don't remember the name, um, created it and lobbied the government not only to give them a uh, patent for that um, drug, but also to deschedule it and make it a Schedule Three. You know, and uh, so what Marinol is, it's synthetic THC, okay? Now, let me backtrack this a little bit, just to make sure that, you know, we're on the same page about these things. The definition of medical cannabis is any combination ratio of cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids administered via different delivery methods, the purpose of which is to exert a specific therapeutic effect. So, you need cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids all acting together. Now, what is a cannabinoid? A cannabinoid is any chemical, whether it be um, endogenously produced, we make cannabinoid-like compounds in our bodies, mm -hmm. plant-based, which is where from the cannabis plant, or um, synthetic, which is where your marinol and these other meds come from. Um, and the re purpose of the cannabinoid molecules is to act within our own endocannabinoid system. All human beings, mammals, animals, even down to the sea squirt, have an endocannabinoid system. So the cannabinoids specifically interact with your endocannabinoid system. What's that, where's that system? Describe that system for me because I know nothing about it. It is all throughout your body, um, based in the central nervous system. But also, um, we have receptors um, that respond to cannabinoid compounds. Now, I will get to that in just a little bit, but I'm just going to bring down the other two definitions. Okay. Okay. Terpenes or compounds that are found in plants, fruits, vegetables that give cannabis its unique smell, okay? One of the terpenes that you'll find in cannabis is called myrcene. Now, myrcene is also found in mangoes and beer hops. Myrcene has a very sedative type of effect. That stony couch lock effect comes <laughs> from myrcene, not necessarily THC. Good indica. Mm. Right. So your indicas, which are more sedative and sleepy, tend to have a high myrcene content. Got it. Now, flavonoids are compounds also found in other fruits and vegetables and plants yep. that give cannabis its unique color. Okay? Purple. So when you see purple or you see a strawberry looking, those are the flavonoids that give unique color. However, the combination of the cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids together constitute what's called an entourage effect. Okay, um, that is a term created by Dr. Raphael Meshulam at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Dr. Meshulam was the um, godfather of cannabis medicine in that he was the one who isolated and discovered the THC molecule in 1964. Wow. And, um, but you need all three to... Um, so if I don't have one, if, if I take one of those out, it's not the same. If I take the flavonoid out... It's not the same. It's not the same. The, What's the, the effect? The best, the best analogy I can give you is... You don't put Tito Jackson on stage by himself and call it a Jackson 5 concert, okay? <laughs> you need Marlon, Jermaine, Randy, Jackie, and Michael went alive, okay? In the same respect, you don't put Keith Richards on stage by himself and call it a Rolling Stones concert. You need Mick, Charlie, Ron, Bill, and those guys, okay? Um, so the, having all three together is more important than isolates. Is that because of the, the biochemical effects on your body? or The entourage effect. Okay. Because the entourage effect. The group. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you want the whole band playing, not just the bass player. You know. Now, um, I know there's a big movement out there to, you know, sell CBD isolates and things like that. 
I'm kind of the, I guess, the black sheep of the family in that respect. I'm not the biggest proponent of isolated cannabinoids. You know? Interesting. I, you need the whole plant. You need all the band members to play. Okay. So of the patients that I treat, I can only count on one or two fingers the people that are using pretty much mostly CBD-only preparations. You know? So just, when they do that, they're just either not getting as much of the effect or just it, not getting anything at all? It, I don't think you're maximizing the bang for your buck. Okay. Wow, so, you know. so there, now, there are some patients that may get some relief mm -hmm. from, let's say, a CBD-only preparation. I mean, as evidenced by these things are flying off the shelves in various stores, you know, and uh, so there are definitely people who get helped by it. But if I'm treating a patient with chronic pain and I really want the whole band, not just an isolate. Now, how does the government view the differences? Do they care about the entourage effect? It seems like they don't. No, the government is wholly ignorant about this whole thing. Yeah. You know, and um, but the, um, so what I'm saying is that, you know, the... The definition of medical cannabis is the use of all three in conjunction to exert a specific therapeutic effect. Okay, and um, another disclaimer that I also make is that everything that I'm telling you about medical cannabis is off-label. Nothing that I am telling you has FDA approval. Okay, that's very important because we have to make that distinction because we cannot make claims that are not you know FDA approved. Mm -hmm. So the use of cannabinoids. Oh, oh, you can't. You can't make those claims. The government. The government can make the claims. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's the biggest issue because with something being Schedule One, it's really, really hard to test and get studies right. done. You cannot do research. You basically, in order to get research on a Schedule One substance, you have to file and get permission from at least three to four government agencies first. You have to have the DEA sign off on it, the FDA sign off it, and NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, sign off on it. Mm. You also, you also used to have to have the U.S. Public Health Service sign off on it. But one thing that Obama did during his presidency, they took out that one requirement. So but you still got to get signed up by three different agencies. And what are the stance of these other agencies? Because we know the DEA, and we know where they stand. Right. But what about NIDA? What was the other ones? Um, the, um, the DEA, the FDA, okay. and NIDA. NIDA is an interesting uh, creature. It's a National Institute of Drug Abuse, part of the National Institute of Health. And NIDA's purpose is to study drug abuse. Okay. The problem is, is that whenever NIDA studies cannabis or whenever NIDA commissions studies on cannabis, they specifically look, come from the angle of looking at harms, mm -hmm. okay? They don't commission studies looking at benefits. NIDA only commissions studies looking at harms. There's like a layer of film and a bias already on top of it before right. it's what's targeting. Right. I think Dr. Sanjay Gupta, even when uh, during an interview, he even quoted that when you look at the totality of the cannabis research out there, 90 plus percent of all this research was designed specifically to show harm. And 5% maybe that shows benefit, that just, whose research was specifically geared to show benefit. You know, So when you have a bias of that flavor, um, it's hard to get anything done with that. You know, And also, um, you gotta keep in mind the other industries who benefit off cannabis estate currently mm -hmm. okay there's an old saying that is attributed to bill clinton but i don't think bill clinton originated the statement though but um you know it is hard for you and i to agree on what the truth is when the lie is paying your salary okay um there are industries out there who benefit on the current status quo of the prohibition of the cannabis plant number one the alcoholic beverage industry um in states where cannabis is consumed beer consumption and alcohol consumption drops a little bit. So they tend to lobby uh, against any relaxation of cannabis laws. Okay? Interesting. Um, you also have the drug makers, the pharmaceutical industry. And, um, but you know, with the power of the people, like in social media, and the work that you guys do, you know, we are quick to call these people out and expose them. Okay? Case in point, Arizona. Uh, during the 2016 election, they had a ballot measure to change their program from a medical to an adult use program, what they call recreational, but it's basically an adult use program. Well, there's a company called INSYS. INSYS gave $500,000 to the anti-legalization effort in Arizona. I think I read about this company. They've also gotten in trouble with a bunch of lawsuits because they had been distributing products. I don't know if it was fentanyl itself, but a very harmful opioids, and they've been sued because of their distribution and their studies yeah. on it in the past. Yes. Um, this company... Um, gave $500,000 to the anti-effort. But yet, this is the same company that makes a um, sublingual version of fentanyl called Subsys. Okay? And they were also on track to make, to get FDA approval 
for a synthetic THC liquid. It actually passed. I saw yes. that recently. Yeah, and it passed. Called Syndros. And a DEA says it's actually healthier than... You gotta be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that's a study I posted on Facebook. So synthetic day. THC with no terpenes, no flavonoids in a liquid that is gonna cost you about a couple of thousand dollars a month or whatever. It's also it's a control. It's also they can have control of Sesame what's being distributed. Oil in there. Yeah. They can make the money off of it's it It's a schedule way. too. And um, so, yeah, so they they blocked the legalization effort because they stood the profit from their syndromes being released. But here's the interesting thing, though. I don't see that drug even going very far. I don't see oncologists going out of their way to write for this medication. Because, to be honest with you, it's very expensive. Your insurance company is not going to cover it. Or if they do, it's at a very high copay. Okay? Because, like, insurance companies, for the most part, don't cover Marinol. Unless you're treating chemo-associated nausea and vomiting or AIDS-related wasting syndrome. Um, in Marinol, if you were to pay cash for Marinol, it would cost you over $250 a month for 60 caps capsules. Yikes. D don't you think doctors or patients or Americans are going to stand up against this at one point? Like, no, we're not taking your made-up tincture that's synthetic versus clearly oh, what's no. better. The people are rising up. And, and to my surprise, you know, I watch what's going on in Oklahoma. And, you know, the people in Oklahoma never cease to amaze me. You know, um, but before I get to Oklahoma, yeah. let me get to a third very important blocker of anything relaxing the cannabis laws. And that's something we all got to pay attention to. There is a huge rehab industrial complex throughout the United States. I recently saw something about this. It's, okay. Oh, it I, is, I never think about that. It is a network of rehab facilities, sober homes, and groups like that. Oh. Okay. That treat narcotic addiction. Makes so much sense. Okay. With... Uh, another substance that can be also abused called Suboxone, okay? But here's the thing. These rehab facilities also make money off the current prohibition of cannabis. Because let's say you got a teenager who gets caught with some cannabis in a state that doesn't have, you know, lax laws or anything like that. Well, that kid's being given a choice. You either build this pretrial diversion program or you get a felony for possession. So naturally, somebody's going to take the pretrial diversion program. In this pretrial diversion program, you pretty much have to declare that you're you have a cannabis use disorder. Oh, I know and you're you going need with rehab. this. <laughs> so they send you to these rehab facilities to get rehabilitated for cannabis use, and these rehabilitation companies either pay cash or they bill your insurance. Now they're billing the insurance company every bed day that the patient is in these facilities. They milk that insurance company like a Christmas cow. Okay, the while you're in rehab, you're also getting your urine tested weekly or even biweekly to make sure you're so clean. Oh, those, those companies make oh, money. No, wait till you talk about the urine. Okay, <laughs> that urine test is people nicknamed it liquid gold in the industry. Even those liquid gold. Are people gold, selling my pee? No, that's no. But the fact is, they build the insurance companies for the testing of the urine. Of dollars. Oh. Okay, and or people got to pay. So people with no insurance, they got to pay this out of pocket in order to stay out of jail because if they fail the urine test. They I'm pulling my hair out right now. Yeah. Think about it. <laughs> Liquid gold. I actually saw a piece. John Oliver actually yes. recently did a piece on it. And it's not that they're like, not reselling the pee, but the fact that right. they can bill and milk the insurance companies. So, oh, yeah, we got to get a test done. Well, this week, time to get a test. Make sure everything's good. Make sure right. you're clean. And, oh, well, we have no money. Well, well now you have no insurance. It's going to cost this amount of money. Well, we don't do it. We got to right. send you back to the judge. Barrow County has this program. I know somebody's just going through that right now. And, you know, they have some type of sliding scale based on your income. But don't you think, okay, so, so let's think about this. If the if those, you know, if there's a complex economic reason, those companies that are sort of indoctrinated into making money that it's hard to get rid of, eventually I foresee that the, the actual marijuana companies, the, the dis, dis, you know, the dispensaries, they can grow large enough where they can lobby themselves and then it transitions into, into them because they can overpower, like they have an ec economic right. clout. Eventually. Well, it's kind of like I was saying before about the golden rule. Yeah. Remember the golden rule? Exactly. He who has the bull makes the rules. Yeah. Okay? So in order else for you to, to change the, the rules, we need someone peeing you, need a little pony, more. you need to pony up enough gold to overpower the opposition's gold yeah. so that the rules can be modified. But here's the catch-22. These dispensaries can't put their money in banks, depending on the federal government. Right. So they can't use that money as political clout to get the favor in terms of lobbying and uh, decisions Exactly. Passed. Because if you look at one of the <laughs> most um, strident opposition organizations, which, is, which they're kind of dwindling nowadays because they've lost so many battles, there's an organization called SAM. Okay. Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Okay, it was started by former Congressman Patrick Kennedy of the Kennedy family and um, a guy named Kevin Sabet, who, interestingly enough, was an Obama appointee in the Drug Czar's office, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, also known as the Drug Czar's office. Kevin Sabet was an official in the Drug Czar's office. And when you look at the board of directors of SAM, 
it is the who's who of the rehab industry. Because everybody that's in that board is somehow affiliated with the rehab industry. Or they're involved with... That's how they got into those positions. Right. Patrick Kennedy dealt with his own demons because he was addicted to narcotics himself. And he went up driving his car into the lawn of the Congress or the whatever, the White House of Congress. And, um, and you know, he's still in recovery right now. Okay? And, um, but here's the thing, though, with this rehab. Let's say you get somebody in for rehab for cannabis use disorder. Well, what are you treating them with? There's nothing. There is no FDA-approved medicine that treats cannabis use disorder. Okay? What are they giving them? Well, if you, have, if, you're a narcotic addic- if you have a narcotic addiction, like for opiates and Percocet, you are given Suboxone. Okay, which is like there an opiate-like is. compound with a little bit of antagonist and agonist to get you into withdrawal a little bit to help get you off the narcotics. No cognitive therapy. Oh, that can't help, you know. Right. Well, no, they say they use CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, but I don't know to what degree does that work, you know, and I don't even understand the logic even behind using this cognitive behavioral therapy because at least the guys say they're doing something, a treatment or whatever. Forget about whatever their evidence that this person is actually, you know, um, truly has something pathological going on with them. So what, what kind of therapy do you think would be best for those types of people so that we can wean them off of sublux? Well, even before that, do you think marijuana you know, has addictive traits and where people get addicted to no. marijuana itself? Um, I, I take a different approach to cannabis because remember, we are all born with an endocannabinoid system, okay? We make cannabis-like compounds in our bodies, okay? So it's part of your biology, whether you choose to believe it or not. Um, your first exposure to exogenous cannabinoids happen when you breastfed because there's two compounds in our bodies that are cannabinoid-like molecules that interact with the receptors in our bodies. One is called anandamide, okay? The other one is called 2-AG, mm-hmm. okay? And in mother's breast milk, it contains 2-AG. So you've been exposed to cannabinoids when you first breastfed. So, so people who don't breastfeed, they're, they, do they lack that in their system? No, I mean, they, they make, you make endogenous cannabinoids yourself. Okay. You know, but we in the medical cannabis world feel that when there are defects within your endocannabinoid system, that's when a lot of different pathological processes tend to occur. Okay? Dr. Mishulam basically said that the purpose of the endocannabinoid system is to help us do five basic things. Eat, sleep, relax, protect, and forget. I love that last one. Okay. <laughs> now, when you have an imbalance of any of these functions, that's a problem. For example, eat. If you go one way, you wind up overeating and eat too much. You go the other way, you, be, you develop anorexia. You're not eating. Okay? Sleep. If you're overly wired, you're not going to get any sleep. Or you can you know, wind up sleeping too much. You know? Relax. If you are, you know, overly um, uh, get wired, you know, you can uh, you will be able to relax. You know, you get these uh, muscle spasms. You know, um, especially like in MS patients, their muscles are very tight and they have a lot of spasms, so their muscles don't relax. You know, you go the other way. You know, um, you can wind up with uh, you know flaccid muscles and you know um, muscle muscle disorders. You know, um, protect. If the body doesn't protect enough, like in the immune system, you can wind up with defects in the in your immune system and prone to other diseases. If your immune system is overprotecting you, that's where we get autoimmune diseases from. No, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Because what is autoimmune disease? Autoimmune disease is your immune system treating parts of your own body like the enemy. Yeah, that's the craziest thing. What do you think? Hachismotos. Um, what's a few names? Of the MS, others? Mycenae gravis. Mm-hmm. You know, and then forget. If you forget too much. That's dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever. If you're not forgetting enough, that's PTSD. Oh, wow. Because there's a protective quality of being able to forget. You know, forget that you saw your, your best friend from high school get his head blown off in Iraq while you were in the army together. You know? Oh, wow. That's a, I never, never thought of it that way. Right. Can't so, balance, the, so that's why when people take exogenous or outside cannabinoids in the form of cannabis, you know, people take it to pretty much balance their endocannabinoid system. Because just like with any oh. biological system, you can have defects and deficiencies. So that's why um, people use cannabis uh, for these types of things. Now, get back to what you were saying about the patient or the teenager or whoever that gets found abusing cannabinoids. Okay, let's say you have this teenage kid who's this chronic user, you know, and he's just using it every day. Well, I don't see that 
child as an addict in a classic sense. Okay? I will try to kind of reverse engineer this and try to say, okay, this kid is using cannabinoids in large amounts every day. What is going on within this kid's own endocannabinoid system that he feels the need to supplement with exogenous cannabinoids? Okay? What these kids or young adults don't need is a, it's not rehab. They need a thorough psychiatric history and physical done by a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist, MD or DO, not no substitutions. Don't, don't you think also that our society very much says that uh, says that we need quick fixes for things. Right. You need to, we're supposed to be a certain way and anything outside of that, you have to fix, that's your problem. You need to fix that. Right. That. Because this, let's say 14 year old who's abusing cannabis, he's trying to treat something. Mm -hmm. Okay? This guy needs a thorough history and physical by a psychiatrist, not a psychologist, not a paraprofessional, not a nurse practitioner, not a PA. No, he needs an MD or DO board certified psychiatrist who doesn't have any ties to the rehab industry examining this kid. Because there's some psychiatrists that are in the rehab industry. So you want to avoid those. But um, um, you know, does this kid have an anxiety disorder? Does this kid have a bipolar disorder? Because with bipolar disorder, you're circulating moods between mania and depression. Okay? Um, and cannabinoids, certain cannabinoids can be helpful in certain situations. For example, you know, cannabis comes in basically well, three varieties, just to keep it simple. Indica, sativa, and hybrid. Indica is more sedating. You know, that's what we say, you know, indica thing in the couch. Sativa is more <laughs> Never uplifting. <laughs> Never heard that one. Sativa is more uplifting, stimulating. You don't want to use it be too much of it because it can trigger anxiety. Or even psychosis in certain prone individuals. Hybrids are genetic mixture of the two. So you have this 14-year-old kid. He's using cannabis every day. He's getting it off the street. You don't know what he doesn't know what he's getting. So suppose this kid has a bipolar disorder and happens to get a sativa from his dealer. Well, that's not the right cannabis for him to take. Or if he has a but manic. Exactly. Yeah. If he has a manic episode, the sativa will make it worse. Okay? Now, if he's having a manic episode, he gets hold of some indica, that actually will help him. But if he's having a depressed episode using an indica, it makes it worse. You know? So, um, and remember, children, teenagers, even children, when by the time they're diagnosed with a psychiatric pathology, they have had that condition brewing for a couple of years. Okay? But because parents... Sometimes they're in denial of what their kid's doing. Don't seek the psychiatric assessment until the kid is already causing harm. You know, so you know um, that's why when you detect, if you think that your child may have a psychiatric pathology, get them into a psychiatrist ASAP. Okay, but unfortunately, because of access issues, you know, it's very hard to find the child, a board-certified child analyst psychiatrist that takes your insurance, or even certain areas. When I was training in Oklahoma, I think we had one psychiatrist in the whole town. Yeah, the way we look at that in America is still not accepted. Right. You should be figured out on your own. You should be strong enough mentally to, to right. figure it out. Right, you know, yeah. and, you know, maybe the teacher may notice something a little off or school counselor may notice something a little off, but that doesn't change the fact that there is this huge lag time between when the child starts exhibiting low, low cooking, uh, slow cooking or low brewing behaviors that may indicate a bipolar disorder or anxiety disorder or whatever until when it gets full blown and that's when the parents are scrambling trying to find a psychiatrist. You know, it is at those early stages when that disease is kind of smoldering and slow cooking. That's when they start reaching for things that, um, um, to help them out. You know, if they are using um, cannabis, they're using it to treat whatever's brewing inside them. You know, if they're bartering ADHD medications, amphetamine stimulants, which we know goes on in the schools. Popular. Okay? This kid is trying to treat something. And because of the in poor access to mental health services from a board certified child medicine psychiatrist. Um, they're way more likely to tell a psychiatrist too than their parents. What, what they're saying? way more likely to tell a psychiatrist what they're feeling than their parents. At least I feel that way. Right. And um, so because we don't have access or by the time the kid gets a full history physical, he's already Baker acted and did all kinds of crazy stuff. You know? Uh, and this kid by that time, I guarantee he's already self-medicating. You know? Because you see his, his, his best buddy takes Adderall or whatever and uh, you know, he gets it from his buddies. Well, do you think this is a bigger problem than just, you know, kids not being able to be properly treated with medical marijuana or with using marijuana itself rather than, you know, getting prescribed a lot of uh, antidepressants or um, anxiety pills? Um, yeah, I mean, um, well, the thing is, we got to be very careful, um, again, in what type of strain you use and what kind of um, dosing and concentration that matters because products can vary all over the place, you know, and there's no, quote, FDA-approved 
sort of fixed cannabis regimen for anybody. That's what I'm saying. Everything I'm telling you is off label. Um, now, kids are commonly prescribed antidepressants, mm -hmm. you know, and it's often by the pediatrician because they, a lot of times they don't have a, they don't have the chance to get a psychiatric assessment. So basically, the fault of the pediatrician to write for these psychiatric medications. And are they even testing for you know the different levels of SSRIs that are um, off or on in their brains to give that yeah, antidepressant? There's no such testing available like that. There isn't. Because I know it's usually one of the big things with antidepressants. Like some people really benefit because those SSRIs, they either don't have them or they're not firing. Right. But what's interesting is there's a you know black box warning, increase in suicidality, in you know in people under 18 when you give SSRIs. So you got to be able to look out for that. Mm -hmm. You know that's why these kids we need more child and psychiatrists. You know to evaluate these kids because a lot of these kids are falling through the cracks. You know again their pediatrician knows them they know them very well and pediatricians are well trained. But when it comes to issues of mental health, you know. Um, it's not enough just to have your pediatrician there. You know, they need to be seen by an MD or DO psychiatrist. You know, and so this kid who's abusing, I want to know what's going on in his mind that he feels the need to use and abuse um, cannabinoids. Uh, now, the uh, other teenage kid that uses cannabis once or twice, giggles and moves on, <laughs> that's not a person with a pathology. Okay, he may be doing this to rebel against his parents. You know, but I'm talking about that chronic user. You know, they don't need rehab because rehab is not going to do anything for them. Rehab is going to do some cognitive behavioral therapy, realize they got whatever issues that they have, and they're not giving any medication, or they do, well, give them an SSRI or whatever. But here's the thing, though. Um, oftentimes, when they, these kids go into rehab, I highly doubt any of them are getting a full evaluation from a board certified psychiatrist. What studies are being done for children, if any, to use medical marijuana? Um, That's something no one talks about. In Colorado, uh, I know that they're doing certain projects involving seizures in children. Mm -hmm. In Israel, I believe in the Technion in Haifa, they're doing a, like a multi-center study about autism, spectrum disorder, and trying out various cannabis compounds, uh, you know, like in the form of sublingual oil, to see if it helps with autism symptoms. That'd be an interesting one to see. Yeah. But yeah, that study is not being done in the U.S. It's being done in Israel. But I mean, there's no, you can't do a study at all right now. And like you said, it's really hard. You have to get the three check marks now, four again. Yeah, and you can only get the, you can only get your cannabis from the University of Mississippi. Well, you can and do, only in smoke form. Oh, so I know my medical marijuana is coming from my, well, my study medical marijuana is always coming from Mississippi. Yeah, and it's only available in smoked form. The researchers are not allowed to change or adulterate the product. It's not good science. So one doctor that has gotten permission to do a study on cannabis is Dr. Sue Sisley. Um, she's a physician in Arizona who got the approval to do the study for veterans with PTSD. And however, she can only use the cannabis from the University of Mississippi. <coughs> she cannot make it into an oil form, has to be smoked. And then when she got the supply from the University of Mississippi, it came to her basically ground up uh, bud, stick, stem, seeds, or whatever in a Ziploc bag sent to her via FedEx. Stop. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and that sample actually tested positive for mold. Jeez. Well, what, what about studies though? You, you mentioned a study that's done in Israel. I'm sure there have to be some great studies that we can look to, at least for information from around the world. Yes and no. Portugal. Yeah. Because some, because most of the drug laws that are written around the world are based off the 1971 War on Drugs law. So a lot of these countries have to re do the same kind of drug laws depending yeah, on. Because there's the uh, UN treaty that you know Canada is going to wind up violating when they make cannabis completely legal throughout the country. I believe it's in October. Yeah. You know. Um, but here's the thing, though. All these studies regarding cannabis. Unfortunately, a lot of them have this one fatal flaw, okay? Um, and that is that there is no such single solitary thing called cannabis, medical cannabis. There is no such single solitary thing called cannabis because it goes back to my definition. It can refer to any combination or ratio of cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids. You have an infinite number of combinations. When you're talking about an FDA-approved drug, you're talking about a fixed molecule at a certain dose, okay? When we use metformin for diabetes, or if we try to answer the question. That's a great, metformin, metformin is amazing. Metformin lowers blood sugar because we're talking about one compound, metformin. It is available in 500, 850, 1,000 milligrams, and there's an extended release and a standard release. But we're talking about one molecule. When you say medical cannabis, again, oh. what, how, what's the ratio wow. of THC to CBD and all the other minor cannabinoids that play a role too, and they're all the band members as well too. So we could mix them up, jumble them together, and come up with right. a ton of different And versions. terpene profile. And we can't even That makes that. a difference. Yeah. You know, um, something with high mercy content, you know, may um, make you more sedate. Something with a high alpha pinene content, which is a terpene that comes from pine trees, you know, that has a lot of like um, what called bronchodilator effects. It ups, opens up the airway of the lungs, 
Okay? Wow. Um, that's why some people with COPD actually get symptom relief from taking cannabis in the extract form because of the alpha pining, which opens up their lungs, which does the same thing as the albuterol. And COPD, I'm guessing something with asthma? COPD is like a chronic lung disease okay. that is um, characterized by either something called chronic bronchitis or emphysema. You've seen in people that have had like asthma for a long time or been smokers for a long time, you know. And would people ingest that in a smoke form or they would ingest that um, to get that extract, relief? Okay. You know, but um, the problem is the smoke form, it can be a pulmonary irritant. Uh, you know? I'd imagine, that's why right. I wanted to make sure. But some of the people that I, there's you know, a few COPD patients that take it in the extract form and it helps with their symptoms. I have one patient who, He's been able to uh, not be having to use his Comavent because the oil extract keeps his lungs open good enough they just have to use it again. But that is one particular mix of cannabinoids, okay? When you are getting cannabinoids from a dispensary, you're getting a certain product and you know how much you're getting. When you're just getting it off the street or growing your own and making it through uh, butter or whatever, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're getting. You know, I don't know how many cannabinoids, terpenes, or flavonoids in this mix. When you're just bringing seeds home from South America and growing it yourself, you don't know yeah. what you're getting. Well, it's the same thing with, like right. you said, with the CBD. I mean, you're only getting a fixed, you know, of the of the trifecta of combination that you're looking for. Right. It's, it's going to help, but it's not going some to. Have, and some have terpenes in them, some don't. Um, some of them don't even have, um, if you were to measure it, take it to a lab, like EVO Labs in Navy, which um, um, actually will uh, analyze whatever cannabis sample you have and tell you how much THC, CBD, what the terpene profile is. You can just bring oil. it to him? You yeah. just bring it over? I know what the Nath Alpha Bus Venture is. That's a fantastic. That's a yeah. fantastic. You should have video there. EVO Labs in Navy. That's unreal. We so, bought some buds off the street and we're going to go take it in and see if, uh, which one's better. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the thing is, though, is that, um, um, you know, so when we're, you, when we're giving, get, talking about therapeutics, you know, we give patients, you know, a, a medication with a dose and a frequency, you know? With cannabis, there's so many different combinations and dosing regimens and choices depending on age, experience, um, what disease you're treating, you know? If I have a patient with colon cancer who's getting chemo and just wants to treat the chemo-associated nausea and vomiting, the dosing is a little different than, let's say, if you wanted to actually make an impact on the tumor itself, you know? So, um, and also, uh, and I'm gonna give a credit and a shout out to my brother from another mother, Dr. Barry Gordon. Love it. Um, he came up with what's called the Doobie Scale, Ooh. which is what we use to analyze, you know, what dosing we're gonna use for the patients. Basically, it's a one through four scale. A Doobie one would be like my 92-year-old grandma who's never touched <laughs> stuff in her entire life, yeah. okay? So in a lot of the elderly who never touch stuff, you dose them very low at first, and then go up as needed, okay? A Doobie two is the one that says, yeah, I did it back in high school, I did it back in college, but I haven't done it for years, okay? Doobie threes are kind of like your weekend warriors. They don't do anything during the week, but on the weekend to relax, they may use cannabis. Doobie four is more like your Snoop Dogg or Willie Nelson. <laughs> Bruce. Or your veteran who's been uh, smoking ever since he got to the army in, in Afghanistan because of PTSD. You know, that's a doobie four. And what the difference that makes is that, you know what, 10 milligrams of THC in a certain type of um, like oil isn't going to touch that doobie four veteran. That's nothing, Tim. Whereas, if you give my 92-year-old grandma, who's a doobie one, 10 milligrams of THC, it may make her a little wacky. You know, I mean, I jokingly say that, you know, she's going to hide in the corner and think that the strawberries are coming after her. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That, that when you, the scale is the most interesting because when you were talking about that level of, like, being able to forget and contri right. attributing that to a lot of people with PTSD, and then people who, you know, you know who may have had problems or, you know, they have a crazy past in their life, whether they have PTSD or not, but, you know, holding on to that something, whether you want to say, you know, it's ego or something, ego or something spiritual, right. there's still something there in those receptors that could be contributed to that, that um, for, for getting level right. of the cannabinoid factor. Yeah, I mean, um, so it does help with PTSD, you know. Uh, now, the American Psychiatric Association says we don't have any evidence to say that cannabis helps PTSD. And that's understandable because there's no such single solitary thing called medical cannabis. Because in the mind of the people at the American Psychiatric Association, they want to make an association between a fixed specific compound that can get FDA approval and a patent to a condition. Well, I think that's a problem for the future of marijuana or right. cannabis itself because there, you know, there's no framework for to enter one thing in for one substance. I mean, I mean could they create one just substance that would be able to be processed through well, the FDA and all these? Well, the way they did because um, GW Pharmaceuticals um, makes a um, cannabis-based medicines. Um, they have a drug called Sativex, which is a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD in a sublingual spray that is used to treat spasticity of muscles in multiple sclerosis patients. 
Um, the drug is available in Europe, I believe in Canada, Australia, and a few other countries. It is not FDA approved or available in the US. Okay? However, there's another medication called Epidiolex, which just got approval by the FDA. Okay? It is basically pure CBD only. Okay? 99% CBD. There's no other terpenes, flavonoids, or anything else in there. Okay? It's 99% CBD and it's a type of strawberry flavored uh, oh, mixture, uh, liquid that is given to children for two specific FDA indications. One is called Dravet, Dravet syndrome, which is a, sy a syndrome involving multiple seizures a day. And the other one is called lennox gastaut syndrome, which is another neurological disorder that causes tens to hundreds of seizures a day. So it is approved just for that. Um, it is going to cost you at least $2,500 a month. So the insurances are not gonna be quick to pay for it. And that's just because it's that expensive to make or just because the insurance, I mean, the company's gonna charge that much to the take money out of insurance. The charge that much. Now, they did, they got the FDA approval based on their studies that he did at NYU. Um, Dr. Oren Davinsky did the study where he showed that Epidiolex reduced seizure frequency in these kids with this disorder. Okay, and that's fine. Now, here's the problem I have with using isolated CBD compound, okay? A lot of these kids, they'll take the CBD by itself. And yes, their seizures will go down, okay? However, at some point, the child may start to have breakthrough seizures. They'll start having some more seizures again, despite being on C CBD by itself. It is at that point that the cannabis clinician usually winds up having to add THC. Or another compound, not available in Florida, but is available in California, Colorado, called THCA. THCA is basically found in the raw plant. Because if you were to take a cannabis plant by itself, if you were to extract the juice out of it without using any heat whatsoever, if you were to eat a raw cannabis plant, it would do absolutely nothing to you. Because the bulk of the cannabinoids in a raw plant is in the form called THCA, or tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. When you take the plant and you light it up, the heat causes a reaction which converts THCA to THC, which is psychoactive. THC is not psychoactive. However, a lot of these seizure patients, when they've added THCA to their regimen, that has significant effects of keeping their seizures under control. Full time though? Like, because with the CBD, it slowly wears off, but with the THCA, is it more of a full time? treatment to you know permanently suppress the seizures well we don't have good studies on that okay you know this is basically what i'm hearing from my canna moms you know moms. <laughs> canna moms that have kids with seizure disorder who tried cbd and it worked at a certain point then it stopped working and they've had to add thc or thc into their regimen thca is not available in florida although i've been asking every dispensary to please start stocking thca um if you're in california colorado they have it there okay you know? and bring that over state lines that's, that's a no-no no no don't do it no there's only two people in the United States who can bring cannabis across state lines. Rosenthal? I, Irvin Rosenfeld and L.B. Musica. Yeah, they're federal patients. Don't forget yeah, Rosenthal. Yeah. Rosenfeld. Rose, Irvin me. Rosenfeld. Okay. So, um, so I, I've seen this in my own practice, too. I, have a, I had a 17-month-old that I was treating for epilepsy disorder. We tried CBD by itself, and it worked for a certain amount, and then it stopped working, so I get a little more breakthrough seizures. So I had, like, one drop of THC to our regimen, and she's doing pretty good with that, actually. But we've actually had to adjust the THC. We've had to increase the dose a little bit on the THC, mm -hmm. you know, to keep our seizure frequency down. So, yeah. so Doc, we're short on time. Yeah, I think we could have gone for a three, four-hour podcast. Easily. But, uh, we have a few more, you know, one or two more things sure. uh, just to throw, throw your way. Um, my, my thing I'm, I want to know is, you know, if, could you recommend a CBD or a CBD THC, a certain brand that, you know, as you've seen from uh, what you've done, from your work, other people's work, other well, the, the, um, the um, products that are available in Florida, there are about seven or eight licensees or companies. Okay, and they all have good products, but there may be certain times I may need a certain type of product that a dispensary may have. For example, if I want to concentrate, you know, like something that has like you know, 900 milligrams of THC and one cc of oil, you know, there's maybe two dispensaries that have concentrates. There are three, there's Sotera, there's True Leaf, and there's Cure Leaf. They have concentrates. The other ones don't have it yet, you know, but if I want a tincture of like a one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD, you know, for example, Knox makes a very good tincture. I've been taking, uh, it's not by Knox, but I've been taking that uh, almost daily. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and they also make topical creams. 
Now, some patients are kind of partial to one company versus another in terms of cream because they truly say that, no, the cream from XXX worked better than the cream from XXY, mm -hmm. you know, so and vice versa. So, you know, uh, you just got to look at what you're giving the patient, what your goals, you know. If a patient wants, um, uh, you know, if it's a pediatric patient, you know, one of the dispensaries, Curely, they offer a 40% pediatric discount. So for a parent that has to buy a lot of cannabis oil from them, that will serve their purpose. So I there's not one specific one that I recommend. It all depends on what case I'm dealing with. So I try to match the patient's needs with the associated dispensary, you know. Mm -hmm. And remember, in Broward County, there are no dispensaries yet. They're only either Dade County or Palm Beach. But, but you go down there deliver. and buy a one-to-one -one in Dade County? Yes. Really, you can. If you have a card. If you have a medical card. If yeah. you have a medical card. If you have a medical card, no. 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 Oh. But it's a lot easier to get a medical card than it was even two years ago. Yes. Um, you have to have one of the nine qualifying conditions. And then there, there is this sort of loophole that says, and any other similar like condition, you know. I like loopholes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's pretty much Do you get any, uh, my answer. The only, question, you know, I, the only question I have to set us to the end would be any piece of reading, book, medium, any websites that you would suggest to our listeners so that they could keep themselves up to date on this stuff. To get um, as knowledgeable as you are. I mean, yeah. 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 Well, um, one book that I suggest is a book called My Medicine by Irving Rosenfeld. He actually wrote a book. Irving. He's coming on the show. Irving. Irvin, I R V I N Rosenfeld. We get the name right. And he has a book called My Medicine. And he's probably going to be at the USCC conference this weekend. He's going to be selling this book. So, but you can, um, I know there's a website. I don't, I don't recall which one, but, um, you can uh, actually buy his book. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it. We'll find it. Put it in the show notes. Yeah, we'll add it in there and put it in the introduction as well. Um, oh, we gotta, yeah, get in contact with Irvin. Yeah, Broward County native. What? We gotta get in contact with Irvin. Bring him on the show as well. Yeah. Oh, you'd love to do your show. Yeah. Fantastic. I'll give his contact number. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, we're just gonna wrap things up right there. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Anybody you know that you know want to give a contact, you know, whether it's email that people can reach you, if they can uh, ask you more questions and come to your practice. How can people find you? Um, uh, they can easily find me at um, uh, I'm in Hallandale Beach. Um, they can um, call um, 954-DOCTORS. That's actually my number. 954-DOCTORS. Wow, he owns the 954-DOCTORS. No, no, that's not me, but um, they're my associates. Okay. Um, okay. And um, they can call the office to make an appointment if in South Florida. But, um, you know, they have to have a qualified condition. Do you have social media that people can, you know, contact you, ask you questions after they listen to the show? Because I'm sure people are going to... Uh, I'm on Facebook, Dr. Michael McKenzie. That'd be the best way to find you? Yeah. We'll put a link in the show notes as well, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to have questions. We're going to want to get you back on here because I, I don't think we even finished with all the information um, that you were dispensing that we could learn from you. Yeah. But thank you again for coming out here. Enjoy that convention today. Yeah, yes. my brain's whirring right now. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. Um, you, know, you guys are New York based, right? I'm up in New York right now, but I'm, we're, we're, we're figuring all that out. But Our show is okay. show's global, US based, but we're, yeah, we're, we travel. Got it. Got it. So, um, yeah, we're just going to wrap things up right there. Guys, make sure you like this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button, share that button, hit the subscribe button as well. Please leave a five-star review. Tell us about everything you enjoyed about the show, the shows in the past, this current show with Doc McKenzie. And, uh, guys, make sure you check out all of our uh, videos and everything we got going on on YouTube. That's at On The Bus Podcast. And please, everybody, go out there and vote. Vote in the midterms. Vote. Vote, vote every time there's an opportunity to vote. Vote. Because, let me tell you something, the power of the people... I mean, Oklahoma amazed me with what they did. Remember, Oklahoma is one of the most conservative states in the country. I lived there for four years. I know the people there. I know the culture there. A very conservative state. And yet, they voted 57% for medical cannabis in Oklahoma. Okay? And then, when the Department of Health tried some shenanigans after the vote to make some really squirrely rules, the people rose up and laid a s administrative smackdown on the Board of Health. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed with what I saw in the club. Spectacular. <laughs> yeah, that's it, guys. Go out and vote. Do what oh. you want. Go and get it. Tell people what you want. Express like, it. Like President Obama said, don't boo, vote. <laughs> 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 All right, guys, that's it. The bus is out. Cheers. Uh, for those who...